In the last few examples of this section, we're going to take everything we know about functions, about first derivatives, about second derivatives, and kind of roll them all up into one problem so that we can sketch the curve of some function, so that we can draw a somewhat accurate representation of that curve. So we're going to start with the original function f of x, and the one key takeaway I'd like to have with f of x is to find the domain of that function. Tell me what x values we're working with. So are we working with a polynomial or are we perhaps working with say a rational function in which case we might have some vertical asymptotes to worry about. Once you've done that we can start to talk about the first derivatives um, and we're just basically going to work our way through the first derivative and try and identify everything we know about the first derivative. So we'll start by saying, okay, let's go find the critical numbers and the partition numbers of f prime. We're going to use those to help us identify where our function is increasing or decreasing. So where is the first derivative positive? Where is the first derivative negative? And then once we have that, we can identify any local maxima or minima values. So we can identify where do I have any minimums, where do I have any maximums. Uh, then we'll move on to the second derivative and repeat a lot of those same ideas. So we'll start by finding the partition numbers of our second derivative. We'll determine where our function is concave up or concave down using our second derivative and using that sign chart. We'll use the sign chart to help us determine where our inflection points lie. And then once we have all of those things, we're going to sketch the graph of f of x. So we're going to work our way through a couple of examples here. I'm going to start with this polynomial here. I have f of x equals x to the fourth plus 4x cubed. And all I want to do is sketch the graph of this function, which all I want to do is there's actually quite a bit to this. So here is my original function f of x. One thing I might that might be helpful is it might be helpful to also identify what is your first derivative and what is your second derivative so that we're not trying to look around in our work to find these things. Um, there's a lot of steps and there's a lot going on in these problems. So the easier you can make it to find important information, the easier you can, uh, the, or the more you can organize your work, I think the better. So I'm just going to find my first derivative here, f prime of x. Let's do that in red. Uh, here it's just a polynomial. It's just my power rule. So I should have 4x to the third power plus 12x squared for f prime. And then right underneath that, just so that I have it ready to go, I'm going to find my second derivative as well, f double prime of x. That is equal to 12x squared plus 24x. So these are here for when we get to those steps. But I'm going to start off by talking about the original function f of x. I'm going to start with that. So I'm going to try and uh, label my work so that you can follow along with the steps that I outlined up above. So here in step one for f of x, um, and actually I'll just write out the whole function, f of x equals x to the fourth plus 4x cubed. Here you just want to look at what type of function are we dealing with. Here we're dealing with a polynomial. The domain of a polynomial I know is negative infinity to positive infinity. So that is my domain. I'm going to highlight that. I'm going to try and only highlight the key important pieces of information that I'll want to refer to later on. But that's really all I want to know for the original function f of x. Once you've got your domain, okay, that's great. We're going to move on. We're going to start to talk about in step two, we're going to look at f prime of x, which we said f prime of x here is 4x cubed plus 12x squared. So I'm going to work my way through the first derivative, which means I want to first identify any critical numbers that I might have. So places where f prime of x is equal to zero, places where f prime of x does not exist. And so first I'll take 4x cubed plus 12x squared, set that equal to zero so that we can solve. So we can, I think factor would be the easiest way to go about this. I'm going to factor out a 4x squared and that will leave me with x plus 3 is equal to zero. And then I can take 
each of these factors and set them equal to zero. So 4x cubed is equal to zero and x plus three is equal to zero. Oops, 4x squared, lost my power there. 4x squared should be. So I'll solve each one of these on the left-hand side. I've got just a little bit more work to do. If I divide by four, I'll have x squared equals zero. Taking the square root gives me, well, still x equals zero. On the right-hand term, x plus three equals zero. That gives me x equals negative three. So these two are critical numbers. And maybe I'll just box these in. Critical numbers are important, yes. They're not, I don't think they're terribly important without also showing that they are the locations of, say, a local minimum or local maximum value. Um, they'll appear later on when we kind of summarize more important information. We also want to talk about right here places where f prime of x does not exist or places where f prime of x is undefined. Here in this case, if you look at f prime of x, we're working with a polynomial. So we the, the domain of a polynomial is negative infinity to positive infinity, which means f prime of x exists everywhere, which means that this is not a situation that we need to be concerned with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and erase that, but again, I think you should be in that habit of thinking about where f prime of x does not exist so that when we come into an example where we do need to think about it, we're not forgetting that step. It's a, I think it's a really, really important step and it's one that's really easy to forget if we don't keep it in mind. So we have our two critical numbers. We've got zero, we've got negative three. I'm going to construct a number line right here. So here's f prime. So here's f prime. My two critical numbers are negative three and zero. And remember, I'd also like to talk about the behavior of that first derivative at these two critical numbers. So I'm just going to look back. How did I find x equals 0 and x equals negative 3? Well, I found those by taking my first derivative and setting it equal to 0. So I'm going to put a little 0 right above each of them. And what that does for me, remember, if I have a derivative of 0, that tells me I have that nice horizontal tangent line. So now I can take a number in each one of these intervals, plug that into my first derivative, look at the sign, and then the sign will tell me is my, is my function, excuse me, my derivative positive or negative, which then tells me is my function increasing or decreasing. So let's start with uh, a number on the left-hand side of negative three, so why not negative four? So this would be four times negative four to the third power plus 12 times negative four squared. Here I'm going to speed ahead a little bit. If I want to plug negative four into my, uh, into my first derivative, I should have a negative 64. And it's really the sign that I care mostly about. It's a negative sign. So I'm going to put a minus sign, or you can put a bunch of little minus signs right there. And remember that we're talking about the first derivative. So since our first derivative is negative, that tells me my function is decreasing. So I always like to draw in that little picture of a decreasing line. Next, I need a number between negative 3 and 0. So let's see if I pick, say, negative 1 and plug that into my first derivative. So 4 times negative 1 to the third plus 12 times negative one squared. So let's see if I plug negative one and this time I get a positive eight. So again, it's that sign I care about. I have a positive eight right here. First derivative is positive, means my function is increasing. So at this point, we can actually already kind of look at this and say, well, yeah, we're gonna have a, uh, a local minimum at x equals negative three. But let's figure that, let's, let's fill out the rest of our number line before we start coming to any conclusions. Uh, now I need a number on the right-hand side of zero. How about positive one? So f prime of one, this is four times one to the third power plus 12 times one squared. Again, I'm just gonna jump ahead a little bit. I end up with a positive 16 here. So my first derivative is positive, which means that my function is increasing. And this has almost everything I think we could, could, could want from this. 
I know that I have um, my function is decreasing. My function is decreasing on negative infinity to negative three, and it is increasing almost everywhere else. We'll say negative three to zero and zero to positive infinity. Be careful that we don't say that the first derivative is increasing, particularly right here at zero, because the value of the derivative is not positive. We said here it was zero. Zero is not a positive number, so we have to put a little break right here in our uh, interval where our function is increasing because technically the function is not increasing at zero. So here are the intervals where our function is increasing or de decreasing. Uh, we'll come back to these later. We can also look at uh, our sign chart here to determine, okay, what's going on? Well, here at negative three, at negative three, I'm decreasing, and then I have that horizontal tangent line. Well, it looks like I've got a local minimum at x equals negative three. So a local min at f of negative three. And I'm just going to go ahead and plug that into my function right now. And we're gonna plug that into our original function f of x here to determine the y value. So I want negative three to the fourth plus four times negative three to the third. And here, let's see, I have a negative 27. So you can say local min at f of negative three equals negative 27, or you could say at negative three comma negative 27. So this also seems pretty important. We have a local minimum and we have its coordinates. What about zero? because we, we also had this critical point of zero. Notice what's happening on our number line. It's positive on the left-hand side and it's positive on the right-hand side. There is no sign change happening here. Well, if there's no sign change, the first derivative test told us that that is not a local extreme value. So when I look at this point right here, this is neither a minimum nor a maximum. It's neither one. So maybe we'll even make a note, it's not a min or max value. It might be important, and, and I think it still is important because this guy right here, that zero, remember that's the value of the derivative. Our function is increasing and then it levels out for a second and then it continues increasing. So we still have this horizontal tangent line right here at x equals zero, but it's just not a minimum or a maximum something else important could be happening there, as we'll see. And once we get to this point, we've kind of found our local extrema. I think that's everything we can say about our first derivative. So, okay, great. Now let's talk about the second derivative. So in step three, step three, what did we say our second derivative was? 12x squared plus 24x. So let me write that down, f double prime of x equals 12x squared plus 24x. So here's our second derivative. And remember the process for finding, say, inflection points is really similar to the process for finding local extrema. We're just happening to work with the second derivative rather than the first derivative. So a lot of the steps I take are gonna look really, really similar. Um, I'm going to start by finding, all right, where is f double prime of x equal to zero? So I'll take 12x squared plus 24x is equal to zero. Here, again, make sure you're factoring these. If you don't factor, if you were to, say, subtract 24x from each side and then divide by, say, 12x or even 24x, um, We'd run into some some big problems uh, here. We would lose a factor of zero, which you really don't want to do. Factoring, I think, is the is always the safest way to solve um, a polynomial to solve an equation. Um, I will always try and factor first, and then if that doesn't work, I will try other things. Um, because I can factor out, say, 12x, and that leaves me with x plus two is equal to zero. 
Again, I'll take each factor, set it equal to zero. 12x equals zero, x plus two equals zero. Here I have x equals zero and x equals negative two. So if you had not factored, if you had just tried to solve for x without the use of factoring, you would have missed out on this factor of zero. And it turns out that's going to be a really important point for us. So I have my two partition numbers. I also should think about, or at least consider, hey, is f double prime of x undefined, or does that not exist at any point in time? And again, check your second derivative. Look at what that second derivative looks like. Here, again, this is a polynomial. We're really not going to have to worry about this case here if we're just working with polynomials. Um, but as we'll see in the next video, we'll take a look at an example where that is something that we do need to worry about. So I have my two partition numbers. I have zero, I have negative two. Let's construct our number line for the second derivative. So we want negative two, we want zero. And again, I'm gonna take a number in each one of these intervals and plug those into this time our second derivative, f double prime of x. So let's start with f double prime of, how about negative three? Let's start there f double prime of negative three. This time I have a positive 36, so how am I getting that? I'm plugging that into f double prime. So 12 times negative, oops, negative three. Negative three squared plus 24 times negative three. Here I'm getting, I said, positive 36. So it's positive on the left-hand side, and I know that on this interval, or here, excuse me, we're talking about the second derivative, so my function should be concave up. Next, I need a number between negative two and zero. I'm going to take, how about negative one? Seems like it would make the most, make, make the most sense here. Uh, 12 times negative one squared plus 24 times negative one. And here, this time, I end up with a negative 12. So my second derivative is negative. Oops. Second derivative is negative, which means that my function must be concave down on that interval. And then I need a number on the right-hand side of 0. I think 1 makes the most sense. We'll plug that into our second derivative. f double prime of 1. This is 12 times 1 quantity squared plus 24 times one. And here this time I end up with a positive 36 again, what do you know? So on the right hand side of zero, our second derivative is positive, which means our function must be concave up. So we have two sign changes occurring. We have two sign changes happening, one at negative two, one at zero, which means we have two inflection points. But before we get too carried away here, I'm gonna say where is this function concave up? It's concave up on negative infinity to negative two and zero to positive infinity. It is concave down on negative two to zero. So we have determined the concavity of our function. Next, I need to find the inflection points and I already have the x values. I know that they occur at negative two and zero. But in order to find the y values, I am going to have to go back all the way back to my original f of x here. So I'm gonna go all the way back to x to the fourth plus four x cubed. So let's see, let's work with negative two. What did I say? This is x to the fourth, so negative two to the fourth plus four times x. This is negative two to the third. Um, and let's see here, when I plug negative two in, what do I get back? I get back a negative 16 here. And then let's do the same thing for zero while we're at it. So I'm gonna plug zero into my original function. This is zero to the fourth power plus four times zero to the third should be equal to zero. So that means I have inflection points. I have two of them. Oops. 
1 at negative 2 comma negative 16. And I always give these as ordered pairs. So negative 2 comma negative 16. And then I have 1 at 0 comma 0. Another at the origin 0, 0. So this is the other, I think, really important piece of information that our second derivative can tell us for right now. And at this point, I think we've gotten everything we can out of this function. All that's really left to do is to take all of this and put it all together into one graph. I'm going to try and make a graph that satisfies all of these conditions. So I think what would be helpful for us is to have all of this information in front of us here. And I'm going to try and summarize the important information. Some information, I think, is more helpful than others. Um, so I think, for example, domain, I think local extrema is going to be tremendously important. And then I actually think concavity and inflection points as well. So I'm going to start, so, so, so most of the problem, this is essentially what I'm trying to say. We'll say domain right here is negative infinity to positive infinity. We said we had a local minimum. Where? What were the coordinates of our local minimum? Negative 3, negative 27. Negative 3, comma, negative 27. Um, if you'd like, you can include where your function is increasing and decreasing. This is something that I personally don't rely on all that much, but I, it might be helpful to have it in front of us. So actually, why don't we just go ahead and copy it down? Uh, we said it was decreasing on negative infinity to negative 3. We said it was increasing on negative 3 to 0, and 0 to positive infinity. Um, what else? It is concave up on negative infinity to negative 2 and 0 to positive infinity. Concave down on negative 2 to 0. And I have inflection points at negative 2 comma negative 16 and 0, 0. Oh boy, we ended up with a lot of cool information right here, which is awesome. So all of this stuff is, is what we have been working through up until this point. We've just been trying to get all of that information. And now we need to make sense of it all and, and plot it all on the same graph. So I'm going to make just a rough sketch here. Your graphs do not need to be perfect, but there are certain things I think I am going to be checking in particular. So if you're looking for a place to start, the things I always recommend starting with, and why don't I highlight those? Let's do this in red maybe. Your local extreme values I think will be tremendously important here in your inflection points. If you're not sure where to start, I always suggest starting with those because those are just the locations. Those are just ordered pairs. They're just points on your graph. So let's see, I have a local min, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. A lot is happening in the left oops, in quadrant three. Let's label our x-axis here by fives. Five, 10, negative 10, 15, 20, negative 20, 25, 30, here's negative 30, and so on. I don't think we'll have anything above the x-axis, at least not much. So okay, I'm gonna start. I have I have a local min at negative three comma negative twenty-seven. So here, let's say, oh, we've got a point right around here. And especially when we're starting to graph these functions, I would encourage you to label what these points are. So we've got this local minimum. I'm actually just going to write in, make a little note to myself that, hey, that's going to be a minimum. After that, we said inflection points, I think, would also be a really good thing to use. So I'm going to use negative 2 comma negative 16. We should have a point, let's say, oops, not there. We'll have a point right around here. And again, I'm going to label this. I'm just going to write a little IP for inflection point there. And then I have another one at the origin, this time at 0, 0. Again, I'm just going to make a note to myself. That's an inflection point. So OK, cool. We've, we've talked at this point then. Oops. 
We've talked at this point about local extrema and inflection points. I'm trying to cross these off. So we've done that, we've done that. The domain, I would just sort of have the domain in the back of your mind. But if it's a polynomial, the domain is, it's helpful in that we know we're not going to have any holes or asymptotes or anything like that. But to be honest, I don't think it's very helpful because it just, there's more of our graph to do. So I, I don't think domain is particularly helpful. You can look at this increasing and decreasing if you'd like. However, I actually think a lot of that is already built in when you say you have a local minimum. When you say you have a local minimum or a local maximum, the idea of where our function is increasing and where our function is decreasing is actually built into that statement. So um, really, I think the, the important part, I think, is going to be right here at 0. What you might want to do, and I, ha I don't have this listed here, but you may want to go back and look at your sign chart for the first derivative, so what we did up here, and identify, OK, we said, highlight this in blue here, we said here at negative 3 and at 0, in particular, my eye is drawn to these parts right here. The, the derivative was 0 at those points. We have horizontal tangent lines. So you may want to sketch those in. I think that would probably be very helpful that, OK, we've got a horizontal tangent line right here at our minimum. And then we have another horizontal tangent line at x equals 0. When it comes to making the rest of our graph and really kind of fleshing it out, I actually think looking at the concavity is surprisingly helpful. It's the last thing that we've learned, and it might still seem like kind of a new idea, but I think the concavity is, is tremendously helpful here. So what I'll look for is I'm going to look just at each wall here. I kind of treat these inflection points as sort of breaks, right? They're, they're kind of breaking up our number line into the three intervals that we talked about with concavity over here. So I'm going to take my first inflection point that I came up with, which was right here at x equals negative 2. What's it look like on the left of negative 2? On negative infinity to negative 2, we said it was concave up. So it's concave up. So on the left of this inflection point, I should have a minimum right here. And then my graph should be concave upward. If you've labeled this as a minimum, the change in uh, whether your function is increasing or decreasing will naturally be built into this. And that's why I think making these little notes to yourself are so helpful. OK, well, what happens? This is uh, concave up. And again, I'll just make a note to myself down here. If it's an inflection point, it changes. So I don't even necessarily need to look at the, the, you know, the information that I found. I know if it's concave up, then the next section has got to be concave down. You can also verify and say, OK, between negative 2 and 0, it's concave down. So it's concave down. This one's a little bit trickier to do. So you may need to sketch it out a little bit, but it's going to look something like this. And here's where that horizontal tangent line is occurring. You can sort of see our graph almost leveling out there at the origin at 0, 0. After that, OK, this is another inflection point, which means the concavity switches. So instead of being down, now we go back to being up. And again, you can kind of confirm that with the information that you found here. It's concave up on 0 to infinity. So on 0 to infinity, it's going to sort of bend back upwards. And it's going to look something like this. So when I look at your graphs, and when I look at the work for your graphs, I, you know, if we don't have exactly the same points right here, that's not a big deal. What I care about is, hey, do we have the same concavity here? Are, we, are, are both of our graphs concave downward there? Um, do we have a minimum right here? Are we switching concavity right here at 0, 0? These are the things that I'm going to be looking for. And this gives us a very accurate representation of what this graph looks like. So. These are very long problems. You want to make sure that you take your time and go slowly with them. Um, but they're excellent review. They really cover everything in these first two sections. We'll do one more example in the next video that's a, it's a little bit 
different looking and we'll see what we mean once we get there but um, take a look at the next video if you would like to see an extra example of sketching these curves.